Hey there, welcome to another edition of Sea of Tranquility's Rant Series. I am your host, CEO and publisher of SOT, Pete Pardo. Today is Monday, August the 7th, and uh, I'm here with a very good friend of mine and local Hudson Valley metal aficionado, Ryan Scow, and uh, welcome to the show, Ryan. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pete. We are here today to do, like I said, another one of our rant shows, and uh, we've been actually plotting this one for a while. I've been talking about it for a couple of weeks. Uh, we're, this is a, a total Iron Maiden theme show, uh, and more. There we go. And more importantly, you know, we feel very strongly. There's a reason why I asked Ryan to join this show is because we feel very strongly about how relevant Iron Maiden still are to the metal scene, Absolutely. how they are still one of the kings. Of uh, a heavy metal of the last like what 35 40 years, and Easily now, yes. there's just so many people out there who you know they discount all the music they've done over the last like 10 or 15 years, they complain about you know the, the set list when they tour, but you know, this band is still drawing, okay, still selling out large arenas, Madison Square Garden, Prudential Center in Newark, everywhere, Barclays yeah. Center in Brooklyn, two nights in a row, yeah. I mean, we did, that's, that's just here in New York. We're, we live in New York, and they sell out everywhere here. And that the fact that they can play multiple nights at all of these different venues, which are only, what, like 10 or 15 miles from each other, mm -hmm. and still sell them out, right? On the same tour, too. On the same tour. And, you know, still sell albums. I mean, that last album was a big seller for them. It was a highly rated album, a reviewed album. It was one of my top favorite albums of the year uh, when it was released. Mine as well. Yeah. Well, absolutely love it. So, you know, we're here to kind of talk a little bit about why Maiden is still so cool. Why are they still, they're still great. And you know what? Maiden's career did not end in after the Seventh Son of the Seventh Son album. But you hear a lot of people complain about that. You know, like, oh, you know, I don't listen to anything they've done since then. So, I, you know, Brave New World, you know, Dances with Death. I mean, all these albums. Matter of Life and Death. Yeah. Uh, Final Frontier, personally, was probably the weakest of the newer ones. Of the newer still ones. a great album. Right. And then Book of Souls, I think, is excellent. I heard a lot of people say it's their best since Seventh Son. I'd probably say it's my personal favorite since Brave New World, but, you know. I, I happen to like the, the latest album quite a bit as well. And, um, you know, I, I think, and I'd like be interested to get your take on this, I think that what a lot of people seem to be having a problem with Maiden's newer music is the, the length of the songs. And maybe the, it's, you know, there is a difference between 80s Maiden and Maiden of today, right? I mean, that the is, songs are a little longer, a little more epic, right? But it's still fucking Maiden. They had long songs back then, but yeah, it's sure more like Hallow Be Thy Name's long, obviously. Rhyming Ancient Mariner's long. Uh, even songs like You Don't Feel That Are Long, Revelations, you know, that's a pretty long song. It doesn't it feel it, but so they've always had long songs, even like Phantom of the Opera. I think that's what, hitting the six minute mark or yeah. so. Yeah, which for back then was kind of lengthy, right? You know, uh, gr granted, this we're talking about early 80s, right? So mm -hmm. this is past the glory era of prog rock where, you know, we had. 10 to 15 and 20 minute songs were fairly normal. Uh, but then we went through a period where they started shortening it up and Maiden started to push the boundaries again. So I, I just, I, I have a hard time understanding why so many people who, you know, are, they're Maiden fans, or at least they say they are, since back in the day, have such a problem with like Maiden's current material. I just, I just don't really get it. It's still Maiden to me. It sounds 100% Maiden to me. Uh, they never lost that magic on any of the albums. Even when they've wavered a little bit, it's still been 100%. You know, they never, even like on, I even like Virtual 11. You know, I don't usually admit that in public, you know, <laughs> no one's watching. But. My main issue with those two albums is I, and I have really nothing against Blaze Bailey as a vocalist. I just don't think he sounds good in that, in that band. I agree. I agree. And that's, you know, and even though some of the material is pretty decent on those two albums, I just... I, I just have a hard time with him. With him and Myron Maiden. Right. You know, it, it's like, and I'm sure there are a lot of people who kind of feel that same way. And there's a lot of people who have said that in the past about, you know, Dio and Sabbath. You're used to the one voice and then someone else comes in. Uh, Ripper, Owens, and Priest. Although that's a little debatable because Ripper is not that different from Halford. Mm -hmm. But Blaze is like... It's night and day. Night and day. So, so I get that. But like, you know... The, the albums that came before that, right? I, did, I don't have an issue with those. You know, those early 90s albums? They're okay by me. I just had a debate a couple days ago with a few friends over Fear of the Dark versus No Prayer for the Dying, over which was better or worse. But those albums, you know, they get a lot of slack over the years. A lot I of like shit. them. Yeah, I think they're fine, you know? Yeah. Not as good as the first seven. I would agree with that. No, but yeah, yeah. But still, it's still it, fine to albums, just a lot of good songs. Discount them totally? I, I, I never understood that. I never understood that. And I, I also don't get, you know, 
Maiden, if you're a Maiden fan, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, they they go out and do these tours uh, every couple of every couple tours. They'll go out and do kind of like a greatest hits tour. I don't know what they actually call it, where they just basically go out and play the songs that they know everybody wants to hear, right? But then, like in between, they'll go out and they'll play. You know, they release a new album and they're going to go out and play a lot of the material from that album. So mm -hmm. on this recent tour, and I don't know if the set list differed at all. It was the same. It was. Book of Souls tour, pretty much from right. last year to this year. So, I so think I don't, I'm trying to remember, what do we have? Five or six new tunes in that tour? I would... At least maybe six. Okay, so six songs off the new album, which, quite frankly, at the show I saw at the Prudential Center in, uh, in Newark, went over very, very well. Really well. It went over great when I saw them uh, in Mad on this tour. It was Prudential Center and then in uh, Barclays uh, Center in Brooklyn. Uh, but like when they come out, if Eternity Should Fail, people were going nuts. They were yeah. singing along every line. Like it was what a, that was a great, great set opener. I mm -hmm. thought it's and perfect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of has that slow build to it. Yep, yep. That's what I guess. That's one of the only complaints I've heard from people about the new albums that I can kind of agree with, even though I love the material. Is like some of the songs, the intro just goes on for a while. But why, that's like, Maine's why, been doing that for a while. They though. have yeah. probably since X Factor or before. You know, this like it's like three minutes of like build up, which I like. It gives the song a lot of tension, a lot of like power, and when it finally gets going, you're like, yeah, yeah where it's going, yep. I guess, you know, if you're used to more of like uh, Aces High where it just kicks in, you know, right off the bat. It doesn't really mess around. Or the Trooper or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I get that. But they really haven't been that band in a long time. That's true. And that was 30 years ago. It was. You, know, you can't was. Still keep doing Power Slave over and over. No. Two de three decades now. And I don't know about you out there, but, you know, I never need to hear 20, um, Aces High again. You know, or, well, not, no, I'm sorry. Aces High is a really good tune. Two minutes to midnight. I never need to hear again. Run to the hills. That song for me. I like the song, but it is a great tune. But it's I don't hear it ever right. again. But there are people who they want to go see Maiden live, and they all that's all they want to hear. Aces high, run to the hills, twenty two Acacia Avenue, Hallowed be thy name, number of the beast. You know, two minutes to midnight. You name it. There, there, there's probably a handful of other ones that we could. I wouldn't about complain here. if they played that set. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes right, but, they do, but and do, I love it. But do you want to see that every single tour? No, the that's the thing, too. Right? And also, I'll give them credit, because they went out on a tour. I forget what year it was. Uh, but they did a tour that was mostly Somewhere in Time and Seven Sun. So they brought out a lot Very of those cool, things. So right? it was a lot of classics, but yeah. it was classics centered around those two albums. Right. That you might not otherwise hear. Yeah. I just, I, I just, I don't know, I don't know what the perfect answer is. Because, you know, if you look at this recent tour, you know, they did... Deano era material, not a lot of it, where they play Wrathchild, right? They did Wrathchild and Iron Maiden. Yeah, okay, so you're generally going to get those two, right? You know, and occasionally I might throw in another song or whatever, but um, that, in recent years, that's what you're going to get. You're always going to get a couple tunes off of Number of the Beast, right? Mm -hmm. You're always going to get a couple off of Peace of Mind and Power Slave, for the most part. Uh, they played uh, Wasted Years, this tour, right? They've been closing with it, yeah, which is yeah, a great song. Really, really cool. Uh, you know, Seventh Son of a Seventh Son kind of gets the shaft most of the time. Um, you're always going to hear Fear of the Dark, right? Mm -hmm. you, it's like you can't, you cannot have a live maintenance show without that song anymore. But there are people who still complain they don't like that song. I love that song. That's a, but, it's a great, it's probably one of their best songs ever, in my opinion. It's perfect for the live environment. It's totally it's perfect is. for singing along. So as soon as the intro comes and everybody knows what's going to happen, and you get that kind of that, uh, just from the first note, yeah. that sense of singing along, which they're so good at. Yeah. You know, and it's like, personally, I, I thought the set list this year was very well balanced. Um, and it kind of hit on all the eras, and it gave you a nice flavor of the new album for those who didn't have it. Judging by what I saw with the crowd that night in uh, in Newark, it seemed like most people were pretty familiar with it. Mm -hmm. You know, I totally get, because I know Maiden's done this a few times, where they go out and tour and they play the entire album, and they start off the show with that, and then they finish with like a half a dozen classics. I get that. That, for some fans, is a little exhausting. I could say that for any band, though, you know, because you always know what, there's no surprise. You know right. exactly what song's going to come next. I'd rather have, like, other, do six new songs like this, but mix it up, you know? Yeah. Throw them out of order. Not all classic. straight ahead. Yeah. yeah. So unless you're doing, like, a classic album tour where you're playing, where they're going to play Power Slave front to back. You know that, yeah. That's a different story, right? But I, I, I totally agree with it. It's like, if you're going to play a majority of a new release, sprinkle it throughout the set. Um, and I think most people can deal with that. But they're just, I mean, you you were down and on the floor, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how many people complained about the set list around you that you heard where they're like, oh, not this song, or why are they playing this? Why don't they do that? There was a couple people in line when we were waiting to get in, which surprised me because you're paying like 150 plus for a GM right. ticket and you're complaining, you know, you should know what you're getting into if you're going to pony up that kind of money to see made and you're like, oh, I can't believe they're not doing class, you know. 
get a nosebleed seat then if you're yeah. you know, if you're worried about it. Yep. If you're going to pay GA, I, that was a little surprising to me. Yeah. A little, I, uh, to hear people complain in that line. But. I forget the year. You might remember because I think you were at the show where they played at the, um, the Meadowlands. About now, I'm going to say it was either late. It was either 2010 or 11, something like that. I could be off by a year or two. And they did basically a hits show. That tour was all all like popular tunes. Mm-hmm. Um, I think mine doesn't. I'm terrible with dates with one and maybe nine days. or ten, 2009 or ten. That sounds right. I had either just moved here uh, or or I was about to. Uh, I live in Newburgh, New York, by the way. We're Hudson Valley guys. Um, I'm sure, so someone was, watching this is like, that's 2009. I know. Yeah. yeah. How do you not remember yeah. that? <laughs> so forgive us if we're off a little bit. But the the point is that they they played a very predictable set on that tour, which you know most hardcore fans still appreciated. But there are some people who they want. That's what they want every tour. It's not going to happen because I know Maiden doesn't want to do that because mm-hmm. I know there's some tunes they're probably sick of playing. There's some tunes they know they have to play. But, you know, if you're a band who've been around this long, and I know some of them do that, there are there are legacy bands who just year after year, they just play that same set over and over and over again. But I know the guys in Maiden, they like to mix it up. They like to, they like to write new music. So they're not going to do that that often. So if that's all you want to hear or want to see, you just sit home and, and listen to Live After Death over and over again ad nauseum, right? There's a million DVDs, high quality videos right. of them you can watch. But to go to like a modern Maiden concert and complain about the fact that they, you know, they didn't play Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner and they didn't play Two Minutes to Midnight and it's like, oh, it's... Yeah, run to the hills again. Right. Yeah. Now, how many times have you actually seen them do that? It's, it's, I don't know. I guess we might be from a, of a different breed because I personally love when older bands mix it up and throw stuff into their set mm-hmm. other than the same old, same old. Because I think that shows that they still have a passion for what they're doing and they, they want to, you know, it's, it's not just about what's going to put butts in the seats. It's about how they can fulfill themselves artistically, right? And go out there and, you know. I had that thought the last couple of times. I saw Sabbath. I'm like, I love Sabbath. It was good to see them while they were still around. But there was a couple of moments where I'm like, I just wish they'd mix it up a little bit. You know, it was so, the set was too predictable yeah. show after show. And the great songs, don't get me wrong, but. You know, Iron Man, Paranoid, War Pigs, a lot of stuff from Paranoid out. But when you're back with Ozzy, you really don't have a choice there, right? Unfortunately, you don't. Yeah, but there's many much material, not to get off topic, from those albums that, like, you could have dug in the, at least a little bit more, you know? I got some classics, but it was very, you know, playing it safe, Yeah, yeah. in my opinion. No, I, I totally agree with it. And as great as, uh, you know, they were on that last tour, I mean, I remember being at the Garden and I was just... You know, because I was just thinking, this is probably the last time I'm ever going to see Black Sabbath. And again, we're getting off topic. But um, I was okay with the set because I knew there were a couple things that were not, you know, overplayed from the last couple tours. But mm-hmm. still, you knew exactly what you were getting that night. But because it was probably going to be the last time you're going to see That's them. a little different. I thought it's in the back of your mind. Yeah. So yeah. I, I didn't see him on this most recent tour. But the tours before that were, before I knew that, I was like, ah, oh, you know, here, here we go with Iron Man again. The same couple songs, but... I guess it's no different than Maiden playing the Trooper, and uh, you know, unfortunately, they couldn't do Hollow Be Thy Name because of the lawsuit on his. I story. know, yeah, yeah. What's the story with that now? Is that? Uh... I don't know. It was it was upsetting to read it. I didn't really look into the details whether it was direct plagiarism or I know it was a little bit of music in some of the lyrics. I think he ripped off, or maybe it was just the lyrics. But as soon as I saw that they weren't going to be playing on his tour, I'm like. Ugh. I know. That, and that's a song like, I just never get tired of hearing. As soon as no, I, that's I, a I, classic. I, yeah, just never a million times, and every time it's just as good. For me, it's like they can not play "Number of the Beast" and probably not play "Run to the Hills," but for my money, "Hollow Be Thy Name" and "22 Acacia Avenue" have always been my two favorite songs on that album. That's what I want to hear. And they haven't played "22 Acacia Avenue." I, I don't think. I don't know why. Since that tour that I'm talking about, that mm-hmm. I saw, they did play. Yeah, it was, yeah. it's been a couple of years. Yeah. I'm going to have to go back and look at old set lists now to just kind of like piece together in my mind what they right. played on what tour. But they do mix it up. you got to give them credit for that. Mm-hmm. You know, like I Absolutely, said, they yeah. don't just come out there and pump out the same set list year after year after year. They don't rest on their laurels at all. No. no and they no. still put butts in seats, you know. Place was packed every time I've seen them. And the crowd was going nuts. On their feet the whole time, cheering, you know, screaming along. Yeah. Even on some of the new songs, it's like Book of Souls is a very long song. Yeah. Uh, Red and the Black is a very long song. It is, yeah. It's got that great instrumental part at the end, which I love. It's my yep. best part of the song. But, you know, people, even then, through those parts, were still enjoying it 100%, you know. Yep. Didn't really slack off. That was just where I was in the front. Like, I was probably 10 feet from the barrier, which is where you're going to get real diehards. But 
you know, it's not like, ah, oh, you know, when are they going to get to the hits? Kind of like rolling a bat. Yep. No, and it's, yeah. So I, I, I still dig them. I think they're still extremely relevant. And, you know, I will you can say what you want about Ghost. And I know a lot of people are hit or miss on Ghost. And I... I I'm a miss. Yeah, I know you're a miss. Um, I've actually been a fan. Uh, I saw some things on this tour with them that, for me, are a little troubling if you're a Ghost fan. Because I sense... And again, we're going off topic a little bit, but we might as well talk about it because they were part of this yeah, tour. Open the tour. Yeah. Um, I sense that they're getting very gimmicky, even more so than they were. And there's this kind of whole, like, I don't, I don't even really know what, what to call it. Like this vaudevillian, like, Broadway play flamboyance that they've got going on now, which they didn't have the first couple of years they were, they were in existence and just starting to hit. And I just, I didn't like, I mean, they were good. I thought they were good. But I expected something different, and I just think now it's 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 Papa's band. He's he going to do everybody, once. Yeah. fired everybody. He's going to be this revolving door of musicians, which quite frankly I could give a shit about as long as the music's still good. But I, I and I, I really like the you know the Meloria, and I like the you know that the, was it Square Square Hammer Square Peg Hammer whatever whatever that the hit tune off the, the EP. I know you don't know. Um, they 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 kicked off the the, the, the show with it. But anyway, uh, I just I see them going down this road that's probably going to turn them into a very poppy. Uh, band that all of a sudden is is left behind because those first couple albums were pretty decent, you know. Uh, even if you don't like them now, you got to admit that very first Ghost album, that's kind of you know. If there's some serious stuff going on there. It was pretty heavy. It was very demonic, you know. And now it's like I think they're they're done with all that. They're like they've they've gotten their notice and you know they've gotten attention and they're making money now. And all I can say is I saw them at Maryland Death Fest years ago when they first came to the states. And like I think it might have been their first show and it had this vibe of. You know, people say Bloister Cult, which I don't really hear, but it had like a 70s rock vibe to it. Vocal harmonies, and, that's uh, that's where I hear the Bloister Cult reference. There are certain vocal harmonies on some of their songs that remind me a little of the Buck Dharma sung songs. But it, that's really it. It had a, like that over, you know, that 70s uh, tone to it. Yeah. And I watched most of their set. And on this tour, I was watching them with both shows I saw it made. I'm watching them, and I'm like, this is like a Tim Burton movie. <laughs> I'm like, it comes out, once he left his uh, the robes behind, it comes out with like the, the suit on. I'm like, this is like watching like. You know, Beetlejuice or any Tim Burton movie. Very the gimmicky. Yeah, it's uh, I. You know, like I said, I I kind of enjoyed them, but I, I just detected some stuff going on there that I'm like, I just don't know where this band is going to be a year from now, and if I'm really even going to be interested. Um, but what I will give Maiden credit for is bringing a band like that on that's done this tour because Maiden, the, the one knock I've had against Maiden is they they don't always bring bands uh, on tour with them that I've actually that I think they should be because I think you know this is an old legacy band mm -hmm. and you know. They have Tom. Alice Cooper. Yeah, true, true, but more often than not, their their choices of opening acts have been kind of like lackluster. And you know what? I think at this stage of their game, this is just my opinion, that a band like Maiden, who's going to draw huge, they're an older band, and they proclaim their love for some of the bands that are more classic era than them. Mm -hmm. They go out there every night and they play Doctor Doctor for fuck's sake every single night. You know what? Bring UFO. Bring UFO on tour with them. Bring Saxon on tour with you. Blue Bring Oyster Cult. Blue Oyster Cult. You ride a heap. I mean, these are bands that are dying to get in front of a bigger audience because a lot of fans have forgotten about them, or even the younger fans mm -hmm. who maybe don't really know them that well. Still, Uriah Heap still tours. Blue Oyster Cult still, they still They'd do. be a great opening band. Absolutely. You know what? And it's like, you know, I mean, you know, Steve Harris, a couple of years ago, he brought his, his daughter's band. With it's like, yeah, a lot of nepotism there. Yeah. son's band. Yeah, it's like nobody's even terrible. About that. So, I, I don't know. That aside, I, I've been pretty happy with uh, Maiden. One last thing before we close out Motorhead this and Dio. That was a great tour with them. Motorhead. Uh, I, remember, I didn't see that. Yeah, that, that, I think that's it was a great tour. Three and I think MSG. Yeah. So every now and then they do product. that, and uh, and the uh, they did a tour with Queensrÿche and Halford's Halford Band. Two thousand for Brave in the World. Yes. That was good too. That, that, was good. that was a very good show, by the way. Um, so my the last thing I wanted to comment on and get your take on before we uh, say goodbye to everybody is uh, Yannick Gers. What is your opinion on his contributions to the band? Name? A friend pointed this out to me recently. He's if you add up all the years of everybody that's been in Maiden, besides obviously Steve Harris, he's had more total years tenure in the band than Adrian Smith has at this point. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean Dave Murray's obviously been obviously, there since yeah. longer than anybody but Steve, but he's like Yannick's been there for how many albums now? You know, pretty much since since what ninety ninety I think right ninety yeah, yeah. 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 He's been on more albums, more so. 
Yeah, he's just part of the furniture at this point. You he know? is. You know, I don't mind him at all. People, I don't. I don't either. Time, but I personally think seeing Maiden up there with three guitar players and Yannick running around and throwing his guitar is actually pretty entertaining because you know the rest of the guys they're not. Oh, well, you know what? And I shouldn't say that because Dickinson. He still runs. They all he's still. all over. Yeah, they're actually pretty energetic, but he's even more so. And I think he just adds this like theatrical element. And you, you know what? Say what you want about Yannick Gers. I, I'm someone who was listening to Yannick back when he was in Gillen, right? This is back in the early 80s. He's a damn good guitar player. Mm -hmm. He just, you know, maybe he doesn't show a lot of it in Maiden because what well, he's doing a lot of this gimmick. There's so much. There's yeah, three guitars and two yeah, other there's legendary only so guitars. Much. Yeah, exactly. It's hard to stand out. But I think... I don't know. I, I couldn't, at this point, I couldn't imagine not seeing that three guitar army sitting it's up there. It's been 17 years they've been doing that. Yeah. Five albums now? Yeah. Brave New World, Dance, Death, Better Life and Death. Yeah, five albums. Yeah. So, to me, it's just part of the furniture. You it know? is. And, and I don't it, think it's going to change. No, it's not. They like them. They want them in there. If they wanted them gone, they would have obviously got them by now. Yeah. And four albums before that. You know, so. Yeah. I know people's like, ah, oh, what are they going to fire them? He's been in Why? the band for ages now. You know, he's not hindering anything. No, not at and all. if you don't like his goofing around on stage, just don't look at him. You know, but he's he adds something to the band. At least I think. Uh, I've never had an issue with. Him. I don't know how much it affects the studio material because you can't really listen to it. Like, it's definitely three guitars versus. Yeah, I absolutely you know, agree. Yeah. Seven Sun works definitely two. I, I can't pick out that level. Of and I don't know how much but... he's writing, helping write the arrangements and mm -hmm. things like that. That could be something that Harris has pretty firm control on. So I don't know, but live it makes no difference to me. It's just I've seen many tours with him now and. Uh, I, I have a hard time taking my eyes off of him sometimes. Oh, he's, he's a character. He's, yeah. Chasing Eddie around, like jabbing Eddie, you know. Yep. Throwing his guitar up in the air, playing it, throwing around his back, and doing all this, you know, widdly widdly stuff. So, I don't know. I, I, I always like Yannick, and I... Um, Absolutely. I don't have an issue. Keep him in the band, which you should be. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, that's kind of our little discussion of Maiden. Uh, we both agree that Iron Maiden in 2017 is totally irrelevant, totally cool, totally still one of the kings of classic metal. One of the best bands of all time. Yeah, your favorite band of all time. I would right? say top two or three, yeah, maybe favorite. That's why I brought him today. Depends on my mood when you wake me up. Yeah. Right, right. So, um, yeah, so you know what? If you don't agree, put it in the comments and give us some feedback. But I think there's going to be a lot of folks out there who do agree. You know what? Maiden's still cool, regardless. Whether you like the newer material or not, um, they're still a cool band. They still kick ass live. And for my money and for Ryan's as well, uh, their recorded output has not dipped one bit. In no. fact, they, they probably could keep doing this for years and years and years. They don't repeat themselves. They're no, not they don't. the same album. They don't sound like they were in the 80s, but it's still... It's still made. It's still, still made. It's still 100%. Still tons of energy. Great songs. Yeah. So, so that's our take. So uh, that's our rant for today. Uh, as always, visit us on the web at www.catranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, and of course we're here on the mighty YouTube. We've got a, uh, a brand new episode of all new stuff, uh, the What's Hot series coming up. And uh, we're going to be cooking up uh, actually another rant this coming Friday, live from Rock Fantasy, uh, for all of you local um, Hudson Valley people, and or just general New York. Middletown, New York. Middletown, New York. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of rant about uh, kind of the sad state of uh, live music in the New York area because there's uh, it, it's not it's not optimal right now. Um, so we're going to talk with Steve Keeler and Ken Pierce is going to be here as well. So uh, I don't know if you're busy, you want to come down too. But I'll try uh, to swing by. Yeah, yeah okay. right. Sounds good. So that's what you have to look forward to. Until next time, take care. Horns up for Maiden. We'll see you next time.